Hey everyone, Cynix here, and today on Art Thoughts, I'm going to be destroying everyone's job security by talking about how AI will most likely take off in the art industry. And since I haven't done it in the last two episodes, I also want to do a little bit of bonus Q&A at the end. But before we plunge into the neural net, I do once again have a sponsor for this video, and it's Audible. Because even as creativity gets streamlined by AI, you're still going to need something to listen to while you're turning those knobs. What better way to prepare your mind for our sci-fi future than with some audiobooks from Audible? Maybe you can catch up on the shenanigans of Wintermute in the original AI classic Neuromancer. Or if you find yourself sick of AI by the end of this, you can always let your ears dive into the AI outlawed universe of Dune, or maybe just some non-AI related sci-fi like uh, Ball Lightning by Cixin Liu because I really love that. Audible members get one free audiobook every month plus access to the wonderful Audible Plus catalog which has all kinds of originals and new content on the regular. It's great, and new Audible members get a 30-day free trial, so just go check it out. You can visit audible.com slash Cenex or text Cenex to 500-500 to try Audible today. And now, some art thoughts. So, will artificial intelligence eventually dominate the art world? Well... I used to feel pretty safe about the near-term future, but I'm going to lay out a potential roadmap for how I think AI actually will infiltrate the art world. Specifically, I'm going to be relating things to more of the concept art and entertainment design fields, as that's my specialty. Um, but first, before I get to that, I do want to take a note of where AI is at in the art world currently. You've probably seen various AI-related art things popping up on social media over the past years. And of course, we're not going to be talking about fully sentient AIs or anything. Uh, this is more of the brand of AIs that just kind of learn from mistakes and kind of brute force their way into improving their algorithms and stuff like that. Recently, you might have seen that AI that just generates random realistic looking faces or uh, perhaps the ones that can take a photo and reinterpret it with a specific style or use another image to kind of modify its aesthetics or something. So some of these things are operating kind of similar to what photo bashing does. In fact, uh, if you look at something like this, here's an AI that actually can just generate photorealistic textures and everything from just patches of color being laid in on a canvas. These types of things already have a huge potential in the art world. They generally have minor glitches that might make them unusable as a final product, but as an in-between step, uh, they are actually wonderful. Much like photo bashing is already used to really shorten the concept process and just build up a lot of density very fast, a lot of these programs can do the exact same thing. You could even combine photo bashing with the AI style manipulation and aesthetic generation type stuff and uh, probably get a really good in-between step that really cuts out even more of the process. Although much like actual photo bashing, you can't bypass a lot of aspects of design theory and even just polishing and rendering and finishing stuff. These tools don't really offer you any guidance in that area because AI doesn't understand aesthetics. But could we make an AI program that actually does understand design theory and aesthetics? I would say mostly yes, even with the current level of technology and knowledge we have. So take notes, because if you feel like being a billionaire, I'm going to give you a clear pipeline of how an AI art system will most likely take over the art world. Step one is training a program to output aesthetically appealing sets of big, medium, small, much in the same way you would an art student. So you can have it draw three boxes of various sizes and try to arrange them on a canvas in an appealing way. Now the trick is to get it to favor certain concepts of design and aesthetics. So things such as the ratio of size difference between the boxes should be favored toward the golden ratio with some standard level of deviation. And uh, things like tension also need to be factored in. So you might have an ideal level of tension, but it needs to figure out a thousand different solutions for how to create that tension. 
Same thing goes for tangents, trying to avoid tangents altogether. So it'll probably make all sorts of weird stuff at first, but eventually you can start training it and telling it that was bad, this is good, and eventually maybe it will get around to getting really good at just generating random solutions to these problems. Unlike most types of AI learning, there's not a single set outcome. You just want it to work within the parameters and figure out as many ways as it can to tackle the problem. Once it starts getting the hang of that, you can move on to step two, which is rhythm. Once again, just like a real art student. So we'll be using some of the information from the first step, but now we're gonna allow the program to make as many boxes as it wants and just follow along a general set path. Maybe you can adjust the levels of density, but the main thing you're training the program to do at this stage is avoid patterns. So if you find too many boxes of the same size spaced out equally, bad robot. If there's no obvious pattern, good robot. Now you can start introducing shape variation. So what makes a good shape? Well, simplicity and flow. You'll have to train it to make interesting shapes that favor minimal sides and obtuse angles and directionality while still allowing for some level of variation. Potentially, you can even have a slider that allows you to adjust the overall sharpness or boxiness or roundness of the shapes. And I'm really shortening the concept of these theories a lot just for the sake of this video. But in theory, you can slowly start piecing together all of these concepts and plug them in with some anchoring idea such as character design. And with all of that, it wouldn't be that hard to make a character thumbnail generator. Just adjust some knobs on how boxy or angular you want the character, maybe a symmetry slider, a density slider, whatever you want. One minute later, you have a thousand thumbnails ready to sift through. Just refine the results as you go and run new algorithms based off specific concepts and whatnot. Where this would truly shine would be when you're able to input a photo of an object and the program analyzes the general shape concepts of that object and generates concepts based on the preferences of that object. If you want to make a tanky warrior character based on this DeWalt cordless drill, just throw some data into the program and let it shoot out a hundred ideas. Eventually, you could probably even design this to do it in low poly 3D. Maybe instead of letting it go hog wild, you can just block some rough blobs as to what silhouette concepts you might prefer, and it spits out a thousand variations that lean toward that idea. You always want to start big and simple, and then just iterate inside of it so each single part of the costume can go through that same process. Although, in theory, I guess it wouldn't be that hard to automate the whole process, just leaving the artist as more of an art director than anything. Advanced versions would be able to generate hyper-realistic 3D faces, anatomy, and potentially even just finished costume models without ever having to do much of anything. The possibilities are endless, and I feel like they can scale easily in any direction. Thumbnail generation is certainly the first step, and it can work for props, characters, and environments, but in 30 years, you'll probably be able to make a AAA video game title in a single afternoon of turning knobs. Pal World already looks like a game that was made by a teenager with an AI game development kit. Anyway, I could go on and on about the minor details and programming specifications required for such a thing, uh, but I think I'll digress for now. You'll probably start seeing some of these concepts implemented in things like Adobe Photoshop within the next five years, you know, if they're smart anyway. I for one welcome our AI overlords. All right, let's answer some questions and comments from previous videos. Sadly, it looks like there's not too many wild questions in the previous Art Thoughts videos. I know it makes sense to just post about whatever the video is about, uh, but really, I would love to hear some weird art thoughts that you guys might have. So, you know, feel free to share them in the comments below. Anyway, let's see. Bad Pillow commented, 15 years of YouTube and still a blue Yeti. Isn't it time to upgrade? Um, I'll be completely honest with you guys. I am terrible with sound technology. I can't really hear what's better or worse. Um, I've tried learning and I've tried messing around with compressors and stuff. I don't, my brain doesn't understand what the goal is for sound quality. I don't know, that sounds like a weird thing to say, 
um, but I guess my brain is just operating in this visual way where it, it just can't figure out, is this better? Is this worse? I don't even know what good sound quality is supposed to sound like. I, it's, it's kind of a mess. Someday, maybe I'll get someone who actually understands sound quality to help me develop a better setup. But yeah, for now, sorry. This is, this is my, my Blue Yeti. This is my baby. From the post-realism video, I did get some comments about how post-realism doesn't exist in the art world. And uh, that's true. There are a ton of words I've used in my videos over the years that are just completely made up. I've made them up just because I feel like they sum up a concept that wasn't quite uh, summed up in the way I liked before. Here's the important thing though. You might have noticed in my video on the color green that I have a pretty strong opinion of how our lexicon affects our mental growth. Adding terminology to specific concepts that don't already have pre-existing terms is actually one of the most important ways to keep expanding the overall knowledge of a field. So don't feel like you need to sit back on the words that have come before. Even those words had their initial starting points, and uh, there's no reason that we can't keep adding new words, as long as they're not redundant and we're talking about new concepts. So. The future will decide uh, what sticks and what doesn't, but I'm still gonna just offer up my words where I can. Lastly, there always seems to be a bunch of comments on my hair, so thank you very much. I guess I'll quickly mention that I've been cutting my own hair since I was nine years old. Uh, before that, my mom used to cut it, but she was really bad with it and she would always cut my ears. So I was just like, I'm gonna do it myself and I've been doing it ever since I was a little kid. It's not too hard really, as I mentioned in the hair anatomy video, most male haircuts roughly fall into a basic box shape formula. All you have to do is just progressively cut the sides and back of the head in a simple gradient, just kind of going outward in a little bit of a box. And I personally think it's good if this is on a bit of an angle, the gradient. So it's going so more so like that. You know, it'll be a little bit lower here and then it'll come up, come up and be basically on an angle like that. I don't know, it's not that complicated if you have some trimmers or something. Uh, and then I just cut the top differently. Actually, I think it's getting a little long now. So maybe, maybe we'll give it a little live cut on video. Let, let's see how it goes. And this is the actual way I cut my hair. So I normally just use some trimmers, cut the sides, and then I'll get like a little hairband and just, let's just put it back in like a knot or something. Something more like that. Um, there we go. Got, got a little knot in the back now. And then just cut it. Just cut it off. Just cut the knot like a disgraced samurai. Um, doesn't, doesn't matter too much. Just, it's got, it's a lot of hair to cut through. So give me a moment here. But yeah, it's just a samurai who just been expelled from his clan. Um, there you go. You got a nice little uh, little brush to make some uh, art out of, and then you can just pull this loose and uh, yeah, shorter, effective. You only have to do that about once every month or two and you're good. So that's it. That's 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 how you uh, get get hair. So yeah, there you go. I just saved myself 20 bucks. You can even add a little sprout to your hair just to make it extra fun and uh, you're good. Fresh, fresh haircut. Um, all right, I'm gonna wrap up this video. It's been a lot of fun and I hope you enjoyed watching it. I personally wanna thank you for watching it. Uh, it means a lot to me to support this channel. So uh, thank you so much. Hopefully the YouTube AI algorithm wasn't mean to this video. You know, I'm pretty friendly toward AI. Yeah, I hope it understands that. I fully welcome our future AI governments. I think that will lead to a lot of good changes in the world personally. Um, and a final huge non-artificial thank you to all of the Patreon supporters. You guys are all awesome. Chromacore 2021 coming soon. Stay tuned. See everyone.